Sziasztok! And welcome to Mr. This is Europe, and here's Hungary. Now let's whet our appetites, shall we? The land that would be Hungary has been inhabited for a very long time. Generations of hardy hunters over time gave way before multiple cultures, including the Celts. The Romans took over next and built cities and baths and arenas until they couldn't anymore because various invaders were storming in and stirring up mischief. And the most famous of these aggressors was Attila the Hun. The Huns had swept in from the east and in the fifth century set up a sizable, if ephemeral, state. And from their base in the vast Hungarian plain, they launched their viciously effective horseback assaults that so terrorized the European continent. After Attila, however, the might of the Hunnic bow was broken and they slowly slipped into obscurity. Control switched to German tribes like the Goths and Gepids until another Eastern people, the Avars, stomped into town. They took on the Byzantine Empire without success and hung around till the 8th century when they were smashed by the Franks under Charlemagne. It seemed as though Hungary was destined to never provide a permanent lodging for any people group until a time in the latter 9th century when additional tribes entered and tried their luck. These were the Magyar folk, led by a man called Arpad. The Magyar people, believed to have originated in distant Siberia, were long in the looking for a homeland and now it appeared they'd found it. Nestled tight in the cool embrace of the Carpathian Mountains, the Magyar are known to us as the Hungarians and they're still here and the rest of this history belongs to them. The determination of the Hungarians to stay in this good land was seen early on at the Battle of Pressburg, where after three days fighting they managed to crush the Germans and solidify their presence in the region. Land is one thing, but you also need stuff. And the Hungarians rampaged across Europe, plundering wherever they went, until 955 when they were decisively stopped by the Germans under Otto I at the Battle of Lechfeld. The Hungarians began to calm down now and focus on consolidation, something seen in the reign of Giza, who permitted the Christian faith to be preached among his pagan subjects. His son Stephen I united Hungarian tribes, threshed his enemies, was crowned first king of Hungary in the year 1000 with the Pope's blessing and oversaw the further spread of the Christian faith in his domains. He was canonized as a saint in 1083. After Stephen, Hungary entered into that tiresome but typical tradition of all kingdoms, that of wrangling royals wrestling for the throne. Under Laszlo I, famed for literally rescuing a damsel in distress, the Hungarians invaded Croatia in 1091, something his hunchbacked successor, Karl Mann, repeated, assuming the crown of Croatia for himself. Medieval Hungary attained great power under Biela III, a time of construction and expansion and wealth and culture. Then 1241 saw the devastating invasion of the Mongols, who galloped into Hungary and slaughtered half the population and rode away the following year. Biela IV wanted to make sure such horrifying destruction never happened again and ordered a huge defensive system of castles to be built. And it was a good thing he did, because in 1285 the Mongols returned. This time the invaders got the whipping of a lifetime and retreated, never more to pose a serious threat to Hungary. The country was strengthened and enriched further under Charles I, an absolute ruler, whose sensational son Louis the Great regained many previously held lands and added a lot more via conquest and inheritance. The country, free from serious peril, flourished and grew. Sigismund of Luxembourg was often absent and not well loved, and mounting taxation caused the peasants of Transylvania to revolt in 1437. And then the Turks arrived. Ottoman forces began wolfing down chunks of Eastern Europe and now were hungry for Hungary. There to stop them was a brave and able general called Hunyar Janos, who, despite several setbacks, stubbornly persisted in resistance and led the Hungarians to victory at the siege of Belgrade in 1456 against the Turks under Mehmed II, the man who'd conquered Constantinople. Hunyadi's son, Matyash, became king of Hungary in 1458, a man of wisdom and learning and military skill who conquered and battled and opened Hungary up to the ideas of the Renaissance, the first country outside Italy to do so. A cultural outburst ensued under its Plato reading philosopher king. Unfortunately, the following monarchs couldn't keep what he'd gained and were not as adept at rulership. The peasants of Transylvania revolted again, led by Doja Gheorghe, who, after defeat and capture, was forced to sit on a heated iron throne with a heated iron crown placed on his head, mocking his alleged kingly ambitions. Meanwhile, the Turks were hammering at the gates again, and after beating the outnumbered Hungarians at the Battle of Mohács in 1526, the country was split in three and would endure many miserable years as a battlefield between Turk and Habsburg Austrian. As the following century progressed, the Austrians gained the upper hand, and bit by bit the Ottomans were kicked out. But some Hungarians did not relish the prospect of continued foreign rule, and Francis II Rákóczi, and his awesome mustache led 
led an anti-Austrian uprising in 1703 that unfortunately did not succeed. If anything, at least Hungary was at peace and had time to heal. Yet what many wanted was reform. Hungary was lagging behind fast advancing Western Europe and Count Széchenyi István aimed to change this and pushed for modernization and took up the cause of the peasants. Nationalism ballooned as Hungarians began to champion their own language and culture, a time when both poet and politician saw eye to eye. It got to the point where you thought there'd be a revolution or something and oh, right on time. The Hungarians fought valiantly under brilliant generals like Artur here, winning great victories such as Ishaseg and Komarom. And the Austrians were on the brink of defeat, but then they called out to Russia for help, and the Russians marched in and it was over. Naturally, this didn't solve the problem of Hungarians wanting independence, and Austria needed cooperation as it faced numerous challenges elsewhere like Prussia. So in 1867, a compromise was agreed to, a dual monarchy called Austria-Hungary, a sort of stronger together sort of thing. Anyway, Hungary finally began rapid modernization. The cities of Buda, Obuda and Pest fused together to make Budapest the co-capital along with Vienna. Construction began on what is perhaps the most beautiful government building in the world, and 1896 saw Hungary complete one of the world's first underground metro systems. But ethnic mistrust persisted, and Austro-Hungarian borders encompassed many other peoples who wanted freedom, and when one Bosnian Serb decided to shoot the future emperor, World War I began. Austria-Hungary allied with Germany, who lost. The Austria-Hungary partnership split, and Hungary was hurled into political confusion, and the 1920s Treaty of Trianon saw Hungary lose over 70% of its land to surrounding states. For many Hungarians, this was the saddest day in their history. In World War II, Hungary allied again with Germany, who lost. Hungary's Jewish population was decimated, and so was the country's economy, and 1945 saw the Soviets in control. From 1949, Hungary became the Hungarian People's Republic, complete with communist propaganda, murderous secret police, and repression. Widespread grievances led to the 1956 revolution, which saw the Soviets invade to brutally crush the rebellion. The last thing Hungary needed now was a bad leader, but fortunately they got a good one in Janos Kadar, a temperate man fond of chess who successfully worked for better conditions, quality of life and tourism increased, and various reforms in the 1980s heralded change and solutions just as the people of the world were trying to solve a Hungarian 3D puzzle called the Rubik's Cube. 1989 saw communism's fall and democracy returned to Hungary, who later joined NATO and the EU and went on to achieve a very high level of human development, and monumental progress was made in this nation which, despite everything, has given and accomplished so much in science, music, literature, sport, and their foods absolutely delicious. So that's it for Hungary, and that's all from me for now. Bye-bye!